particular kind of wetland that uh, I am personally passionate about and interested in. Um, wetlands come in all, all shapes and sizes, and, and most of us are probably familiar with different types of wetlands. There's, there's marshes, there's swamps that have trees in them, there's salt marshes, there's bogs, um, and then there's vernal pools, which are just another type of wetland with a little bit different characteristics to them. So, so tonight's program is a little bit about what makes a, a, a vernal pool, why they're cool, um, who lives there, why those animals are dependent on that particular habitat, and um, a little bit about what, what we might do to, to protect them. And uh, we have a little bit of a quiz at the end, don't, don't panic too much and sign off before the end, but um, it's more of a, uh, what can you listen for this spring as the woods open up and the snow melts uh, in terms of the, the world of frogs. So we'll start with um, what is a vernal pool, first of all, the definition of a vernal pool. Um, first of all, they, they tend to be bodies of water that are quite small, usually under two acres, um, often times less. They often look like just a puddle of water in the woods. Um, they're seasonal and temporary. Uh, temporary is kind of a vague word. Some vernal pools dry up in the middle of the summer. Some retain water through the fall and then recharge. Some will go years for, with having water in the summertime and then have a period of drought um, after that. So there's no, you know, temporary is a little bit of a vague word. Um, the pools tend to be isolated. Uh, there's no permanent inlet or outlet to it. In other words, there are no streams flowing through it, except for maybe um, intermittent streams that are part of the spring runoff and snowmelt. Um, because of that, those vernal pools, those special habitats, don't support um, a viable population of fish. They're, they're either, um, you know, they either dry up or they're too shallow and too warm to support a fish population. Because of all those characteristics, the other key factor is that they're really important breeding habitat for certain amphibians, especially, and certain invertebrates, um, animals without, without backbones. So um, that, that's a really key part of the definition is a breeding habitat for certain amphibians and verte invertebrates. That really defines the difference between a vernal pool and a, and a puddle in the ditch on the side of the road. Um, vernal pools are, are, as I said, seasonal and they're temporary. So right now, the vernal pools are filled with ice and snow. Um, you may or not may or may not be able to actually figure out that they're vernal pools because they're covered with snow and ice except that they're a depression in the landscape and they're good to check back on. So when the snow melts and the, fall, and the spring rains come, they fill up with water. And at the same time, they fill up with all kinds of different life forms, um, amphibians to, to insects and other invertebrates. And then generally they dry up by the middle to the end of the summer, or at least get really shallow and warm um, so that they don't support that fish population. Vernal pools can be found in lots of different kinds of places. Um, probably the most, uh, most common and, and what we think of mostly for vernal pools is the, the upland vernal pools. There are depressions in the forest that fill with water. They don't really have vegetation that's associated with them. They're just depressions that fill with water. There are also um, vernal pools that are formed along the, the edges of rivers, in the floodplains of rivers where uh, high water is cut off and a puddle of water is left behind. Those can become uh, vernal pools. Um, sometimes on the edges of lakes, the, the depressions that form behind the, the berm or the edge or shoreline of the lake uh, can be a, a vernal pool that's filled partly with spring and summer snowmelt, or spring and winter snowmelt, sorry, and maybe a um, temporary stream that flows when the snow is, snow is melting. This is one little one that's formed on the north side of um, Chicago Lake, just off the lake, not connected to it. Some vernal pools have lots of shrubs, kind of scrub shrub habitat or grasslands. And then there's some forested uh, vernal pools in oftentimes red maples are associated with those forested swamps. You might've heard of the term red maple swamp um, here in New England. And those are just little depressions between the, the hummocks that the red maples are, are growing out of. So why are vernal pools important? Well, 
Uh, there's a number of different reasons. Um, one is that they support um, a breeding population of specific amphibians that depend on those vernal pools for their breeding habitat. Um, unlike other amphibians that may use lakes and ponds and marshes, these particular animals are specific to vernal pools and the seasonality of those vernal pools. So in New Hampshire, um, as in other New, New England states, uh, there are a number of what are referred to as um, indicator species or obligate species. Those are the animals that depend on vernal pools for breeding habitat. Um, those include the yellow spotted, which is the largest of our, our, uh, our salamanders in New Hampshire, the blue spotted and the Jefferson salamander, which is a little bit smaller. Um, they, uh, the Jefferson salamander also um, hybridizes with a blue spotted salamander. So there's sort of a, a Jefferson salamander complex that biologists often refer to that, are, that have very similar habitats. But all of those salamanders depend on vernal pools for a breeding habitat. And then our only frog that's dependent on vernal pools for breeding is the wood frog. And then out of character with the, the, the amphibians in this picture is the fairy shrimp, which is a type of crustacean, which also depends on um, vernal pools for their breeding habitat. So um, most of these animals um, spend 11 months or almost the entire year um, outside of vernal pools living in the surrounding forest. Um, in the case of the, um, the fairy shrimp, they, they live their entire life in the vernal pool, but in the wintertime, they're a dormant egg stage. Um, they never leave the pool. But the spotted salamanders and the wood frogs spend all of their time when they're not in the pool breeding in the surrounding woodlands. So in the spring, as the snow melts, and the ice melts, and our first warm spring rains come, usually the ground is thawed or, or mostly thawed in the forest and the temperatures are above 40 degrees and it rains and it's nighttime, those amphibians emerge from their, their woodland habitats and migrate to the nearest vernal pool or the vernal pool that they um, actually were hatched in. So they end up uh, uh, leaving and going sometimes over snow banks at the side of the road, sometimes over snow, um, but their, their uh, hard drive is to go to those vernal pools to breed. You might have heard of a term uh, referred to as big night in reference to vernal pools and in, term to, in terms of migration for amphibians in the spring. Big night um, can actually be either a, a, a one big night or it can be multiple little big nights. Um, it's a night when all amphibians are on the move. It's wet, it's warm, they're ready to go um, to their breeding pools or their other pools that they use for, for feeding. Um, and it's actually one of the Northeast's most significant uh, animal wildlife migrations. Um, right up there with wildebeest in Africa and caribou in, in uh, northern Quebec and Alaska um, on, a, on a much smaller size of the animal, but a huge scale because there are so many of them that are migrating to these special habitats. So let's start with looking at the, the spotted salamanders um, and their uh, life history because it tells a little bit of a different story than the, than the other two animals. Um, the, the, all these salamanders in this picture are, are referred to as mole salamanders, like the moles that dig around in your lawn and eat, eat uh, uh, things in your garden. Um, they spend their, almost their entire life underground in the forest, tunneling through other animals' burrows, under logs, in stumps, they're quite large. The spotted, yellow spotted salamander is the largest. They can grow up to eight inches long. Blue salamanders are a little bit smaller, up to five inches, and then the Jefferson is, is a little bit smaller than that. But in, in comparison to other salamanders, um, they're quite large. So when they, when they end up leaving their forest habitat to go to their breeding pools, they tend to do it all at once. Um, or all at once over several days so that they get there all at the same time. The males generally arrive first um, and then the females and they, they form these kind of dances and they, they, it's referred to as salamander congressing, um, but you can think of it as an elaborate courtship dance where they nudge each other and sometimes you'll find balls of salamanders all together. Um, and that stimulates the, the, the breeding process. So what happens is the males deposit these little um, white packages called spermatophores, 
if you look in the in the bigger picture, these little white dots um, kind of get my arrow here. These little white deer dots here are all these spermatophores that the males drop on the bottom of the pool. Attached to the leaf litter or to twigs. And then the females come along and they take up those spermatophore in their vent or their cloaca. Um, and those sperm uh, fertilize the eggs that she's carrying inside. And then she'll lay those eggs attached to twigs or grass or uh, leaves on the bottom of the pool. Sometimes um, two or three masses, sometimes just one big one, as many as up to 100 eggs in a, in a mass. So quite a few for one little, little female. Uh, you'll notice in this photo that um, there are uh, the little black embryos. Those are the eggs. They've got a little jelly capsule around them. And then there's a larger capsule around the whole mass that's um, kind of firm. If you were to pick up that mass in your hand a little bit and lift it just a little bit to the surface of the water, you'd, you'd, you'd feel like you could, could pick it up without it actually oozing through your fingers. Um, so those are their eggs and they, they'll lay them uh, in singly or sometimes if there's a limited space for them to lay eggs and there's a lot of salamanders, they'll, they'll uh, put them all together in one area of the pool. But for the most part, they scatter them around, around the pool. You'll notice in this salamander mass, um, there's a little bit of a green tinge to this. This is a um, symbiotic algae that grows on the egg masses of salamanders and frogs. The algae uh, produces oxygen for the growing embryos. Um, and the, the algae gets nutrients from the embryos as they grow and, and produce waste products or nutrients for that algae to grow, which is kind of cool. Sometimes you'll find them green, sometimes they'll be clear, sometimes they'll be um, cloudy white. Uh, it, it's uh, all variable. And then the little salamanders uh, look a little like fish right before they hatch. And as they hatch, they look a little bit like fish as well. Um, the blue spotted salamanders are similar to the yellow spotted salamanders in, in um, arrival time and reproductive courtship, uh, but the eggs are, egg masses are, are quite a bit smaller. They tend to be a little looser and more drippy, um, but they're, they're in the similar areas that uh, yellow spotted salamander eggs will be. So yellow spotted salamanders, blue spotted salamanders, those salamanders are carnivores. They, they feed on other um, smaller invertebrates in the pool, sometimes each other, uh, that happens occasionally. But when, as they're growing, they have these little uh, flurry of um, gills, external gills that they use to take oxygen out of the water. And then as they're growing and eating, they're developing lungs internally that will function when they, when they actually leave the pool. In the process, they're growing new legs. And then by the time they're ready to emerge from the pool and go back to the woods after, um, say, a month or two months, sometimes shorter, um, they look very much like the adults, except their spots are a little bit smaller and they're only about an inch long. And they migrate out of the pool off into the woods where they'll spend um, most of the rest of their life, except when they return at a few years old to the pool that they hatched from to start that reproductive cycle again. And now wood frogs, that's another indicator species here in New Hampshire. The wood frogs are often referred to as explosive breeders. They, they all hurry up and get to the pool at the same time. They, uh, the males arrive first, they start calling, they're quite loud, and they attract the females who arrive a little bit later. And they, um, have a little bit different reproductive process. They have external fertilization of their eggs. So when the female, who's a little bit bigger and a little bit lighter colored, as in the upper right-hand picture, um, uh, arrives, a male will climb on the top. The male's a little bit smaller and darker. When she lays her eggs, he releases the sperm into the water, fertilize, fertilize the eggs as they're being expelled. If you look in this upper left-hand picture, you'll notice that um, there are some uh, smaller packets right here, and then there are bigger ones. The smaller ones that are the ones that have just been laid and fertilized. They come out uh, about the size of uh, a quarter, maybe a little bit bigger. And then over the next couple of days, they fill with water and expand to become more softball, softball size. And the wood frogs tend to, to 
try to all lay their eggs in the same place. Um, there are often layers and layers of wood frog eggs on top of each other, um, especially in small, small vernal pools. They too uh, have a, an algae that grows with them. And uh, as the tadpoles hatch, as in this lower right-hand picture, they, uh, they will, they'll graze or feed on the algae in those egg packets. And they'll stay with the egg packet for a little while before they, they actually disperse off into the rest of the pool. Um, and they continue to be uh, mostly grazers as they, as they mature. And then as they're developing, um, the internal gills that they've been using to take oxygen from the water um, start to uh, be reabsorbed and their lungs uh, are developing. Uh, frogs breathe with lungs, so they're, when they're leaving the pool, they actually have to have those lungs well developed before they leave. So back legs first, then front legs, lungs develop, they reabsorb their tails, and then by the time they're ready to leave the pool to go back to the woods or go to the woods, they're, they look exactly like the adults, sort of a tan colored with that really distinctive black mask behind their eye, except that they're only about the size of your thumbnail. So they're quite small when they, they disperse. But try to imagine for a minute, um, a female uh, wood frog who comes to a, a vernal pool, she lays one mass of eggs, can have as many as a thousand eggs in that mass. And then you multiply that by say 10 or 20 females that lay eggs in that pool, and then try to imagine what it's like to be around that pool when all of those little froglets leave um, sometime in the first part of July, which is a pretty amazing thing to see and to imagine as they uh, disperse off into the forest surrounding the vernal pool. Just to give you a sense of how far adults go, um, spotted salamanders don't go quite as far as some of the other amphibians. The wood frog has the, the record, um, 3,000 feet. Some have been recorded a mile away from their vernal pool. So imagine what a trek that is for a, a hopping critter uh, or a spotted salamander that has just tiny short legs um, to carry it up and over logs and, and through the woods and over rocks and all the places that they, they go. So they're gonna adventure back away from the vernal pool sometime in July or August or before the pool dries up um, and uh, spend the rest of the year in the forest. So that takes care of the, the, um, the amphibians that are dependent on vernal pools. There's one invertebrate, this is called a fairy shrimp. The fairy shrimp is a type of crustacean. So it has an exoskeleton, it has a little stocked eyes. It's got um, 10 pairs of, of frilly legs that it uses for swimming. They tend to swim on their back um, and they're filter feeders. So they're moving through the vernal pool in the spring um, filtering out uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton as they get about, about their business. They, um, they have never left the pool. Um, the eggs survived the, the drying of the pool in the summer and the freezing in the winter time. And they hatch early in the spring, April to May, um, to become juvenile uh, fairy shrimp. And over the course of a number of weeks, they, uh, molt a few times and become adults. And the female forms this little um, egg sac at the base of her tail. That's where the eggs are forming. They mate and, uh, and lay eggs. So this picture just gives you an idea of some of uh, what fairy shrimp here and here and here look like compared to a whole diversity of other invertebrates that live in vernal pools and other types of wetlands. There's caddisflies here and down in this corner, there's a mosquito larva here. Um, there are a number of different uh, damselflies in here and uh, probably some mayflies. I don't see the mayflies. Um, they're a little bit harder to tell apart from the damselflies unless you get a really good picture of them. But they all share that, that habitat with, with the fairy shrimp. So after six weeks or so, when, when water temperatures get too warm, they can't tolerate warm body, uh, water temperatures, they start to die off. Um, the females have laid her eggs, the eggs have settled to the bottom of the pool, and those eggs will sit uh, through the drying of the pool and over winter. They, they have to go through a cycle of desiccation or drying and freezing in order to be viable. And then they'll hatch out the following spring. 
Um, occasionally, those eggs will sit down in the leaf litter for years, um, waiting for just the right conditions to actually hatch. And they're viable uh, during that entire time, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. So I like to think of um, um, vernal pools as, as uh, kind of temporary nurseries for, for these species in particular. Um, those are the indicator species. Those are the species that um, completely depend on vernal pools. But there's a whole bunch of other, um, mostly amphibians, but other invertebrates that also will use vernal pools, as well as larger ponds and lakes and, and wetlands. Um, the top there is a spring peeper, there's an American toad, pickerel frog, all of those have um, reproductive um, processes similar to the wood frog. Um, their development time is, tends to be pretty short. It doesn't take long for the eggs to hatch, um, but they are adapted to lay their eggs in other types of wetlands as well. So you'll hear and see um, peepers and, and toads and pickerel frogs um, and a number of other frogs in some of the larger wetlands as well. They do use those vernal pools, um, if not for breeding, at least for feeding during the, the summertime or early spring. Uh, bullfrogs and green frogs are a little bit different. They, they may visit vernal pools for feeding, but if they reproduce their, their eggs won't be, or their young won't be successful. Green frogs and bullfrogs have a much longer development time in terms of their tadpoles. The tadpoles take two to four years to develop. So if they lay their eggs in a temporary pool, those tadpoles won't, won't survive. Um, they need a, a body of water that retains water all year round. So those tadpoles can survive for a couple of years before they grow legs and lungs and hop out. There's a number of other um, salamanders that also depend on um, other wetlands, but will use vernal pools for feeding or for um, sometimes for breeding if it's a vernal pool that will retain water a little bit later in the season. Um, are aquatic as adults, so they spend most of their time in the water, but then they have this juvenile phase down below this red spotted newt on the left um, that's called a red eft. And they spend two to four years living in the forest. So they, they are hatched in the water and they leave the water as young, young um, red Fs. I like to think of them as the, the teenagers of the red Fs to go live in the woods for a few years before they return to the water and grow a flattened tail and um, continue breeding. And then the uh, redback salamander is a salamander that is strictly forest salamander. It never goes to the water to lay eggs. It lays its eggs underneath the leaf litter and under logs where there's plenty of moisture, guards its eggs, and the eggs, um, the larvae develop within that egg and hatch out as young, young salamanders. Um, and then the four-toed salamander, it's a little bit different though. They may visit a vernal pool. They may lay their eggs um, in the sphagnum moss at the edge of the pool. And when the eggs hatch, the larva kind of slither down the side of the, the moss into the, the pool water and, and grow similarly to the way spotted salamanders uh, grow as well. Um, but they're not dependent on vernal pools. You'll find them in lots of different types of, of wetlands in those kind of moss or grassy hummocks where they lay their eggs. And the rest of the time they're living in the surrounding forest. There are a whole bunch of different other invertebrates that will uh, in use vernal pools to, to grow up or to visit to feed. Um, I kind of think of, uh, in addition to vernal pools as being nurseries, they're diners for a whole lot of other different animals. Um, dragonflies and giant water bags and, and predaceous diving beetles all feed on other uh, feed on amphibians. So it's good if there aren't too many of them in a vernal pool, but a lot of them also get eaten by the various frogs and salamanders. So they also use vernal pools in addition to other wetlands. There are a number of uh, reptiles that use vernal pools, not for breeding the way that amphibians do, but to visit to feed in the early spring. They've come out of hibernation. Um, they don't have much in the, in the way of fat reserves, so they're out looking for um, someplace where they can feed heavily and build up their fat reserves um, for the summer. Uh, spotted turtles and Blanding's turtles are both um, on the New Hampshire and New list. They're found more in the southern part of the state, but they depend heavily on vernal pools as these temporary, temporary kind of feeding grounds within their range that they'll visit throughout the, throughout the early spring and, and summer. 
as they're moving around their habitat. And that's true of ribbon snakes as well. Ribbon snakes uh, look similar to garter snakes, but they have very distinct yellow lines. And uh, they travel around the edges of vernal pools and in vernal pools, they're, they're quite aquatic, feeding on frogs and salamanders and other insects. Um, but they'll also use other types of wetlands as well. Unlike the amphibians, they, like most reptiles, lay their eggs on land. So now what? Um, we know a little bit about uh, vernal pools and what lives there and what's unique about those critters that live there. Um, but sometimes we forget that, that in this isolated little pool, there are lots of connections with the surrounding habitat, the surrounding forest. Um, and we forget that they play a really important role in the, in the ecology of those, those uplands. So one, th one thing to think about when you're thinking about why vernal pools are important to the surrounding forest is to think about um, sort of an ecological kind of rule in a way that everything's connected in the natural world. It, it's hard to remove anything from the natural world without it influencing some other plant or animal or other system. Um, this is again, another little vernal pool next to, next to Lake Chicago at the Northern end, separated by a berm around the lake. Um, the bullfrogs and green frogs are, are re reproducing in the lake. The little vernal pool there has spotted salamanders and wood frogs in it. Um, they may go back and forth and use, share those different kind of habitats, but they're each um, evolved for their own habitat for reproduction. And when those uh, salamanders, spotted salamanders and wood frogs leave that vernal pool, they're not gonna go to the lake. They're gonna go in the opposite direction to the woodlands that are surrounding that, that pool. So everything there is connected. Um, I like to think of um, vernal pools as these little um, kind of isolated pockets of diversity. Uh, when you look or, or, or are standing in the middle of vernal pool, it doesn't look like there's much going on there, but if you really look, there's a lot going on. There are lots of different amphibians that are using that pool, lots of different insects and other invertebrates. Um, and they support um, all those different species. And then all those different species, in a sense, um, are exported out of that vernal pool because they don't spend their entire life in the vernal pool. They just visit it to reproduce. And then they go back to the woods um, into the surrounding forest. The scientists have done a number of studies where they found that the biomass or the weight of the amphibians that use vernal pools in a given acreage um, is far more than all of the weight of the birds and mammals that occupy that same acreage. So that biomass of amphibians is crucial. Um, and it's always being exported into the surrounding forest. One of my favorite quotes related to, to vernal pools is the one in the lower part of this slide. Leaves and organic matter fuel the growth in pools. Leaves hop away as frogs, fly away as various aquatic insects, or walk away slowly as salamanders. And I, I think that's a really good, simple way of saying uh, all these critters go back to the woods and uh, provide nutrients and food sources for a whole lot of other animals um, that don't necessarily use the vernal pool, but rely on that food chain um, for their own survival. When those pools dry up, um, it's often difficult to find those pools. Although if you look carefully, um, late in the summer or in the fall, you can find where vernal pools were. Again, there are shallow depressions in the, in the landscape. If you look at the leaves, the leaves might look dark or the vegetation might look like it has silt all over it. So it has different color to it. It's a good place to kind of flag in your mind to come back and check in the spring when it might be filled with water to see if it's got those indicator uh, frogs and salamanders living there or um, fairy shrimp. So if, if um, these vernal pools are so important to the surrounding habitat, one of the challenges of conservation uh, for vernal pools is how to maintain that connectivity between the, the wetland itself and the upland habitats where most of those animals live the rest of the year. I, I love this picture because it, it shows a couple of vernal pools on this park in, in Massachusetts. They're pointed out there in, in orange, orange dots. Um, those are wetlands themselves that may or may not dry up completely in the summer. And then surrounding it are areas of protected land where the animals that depend on that vernal pool can go for the rest of the year. 
And if you look around the edges of that frame of the picture, you'll notice there's a lot of development going on. And that's one of the problems with um, vernal pool protection is development really carves up that connectivity and divides up and separates vernal pools from the upland habitats that those animals depend on the rest of the year. Um, there's uh, fortunately um, a lot of work that's been done related to vernal pool protection, um, not just in New Hampshire, but throughout New England, um, identifying vernal pools, mapping vernal pools, and then studying the relationships between those vernal pools and the surrounding, the surrounding habitat. A lot of that's been done by um, state wildlife biologists, by um, volunteers, citizen volunteers, and um, universities, uh, all sorts of great studies that are going on. And in, in my mind, one of the best ways to protect vernal pools and the animals that depend on them is by learning as much as we can about them. Uh, not just the scientists, but all of us who, who live in a, a community, um, learning where the vernal pools are in the area and figuring out how we might plan our communities to protect those particular habitats. Um, the state of New Hampshire has this great booklet up in the left corner of that slide um, is documenting and, and uh, identifying vernal pools. And it has great information about uh, the animals that live there, what kind of habitat they need, what vernal pools are, how you can identify vernal pools, how you can help the state um, map those vernal pools. Much of the vernal pool mapping is done voluntarily rather than through regulations in the state and, and most of the New England states. Um, so that's one way, one way to get involved. Um, the, the big night that happens uh, in the spring or the several big nights, if it, it turns out to be that, um, there are a lot of towns throughout New England who close roads um, that are significant wildlife migration routes um, just for amphibians, which is pretty cool when you think about it. Um, there are places where uh, either land trusts or towns organize um, crossing brigades to get volunteers out at night in the rain. So if that really floats your boat to, to be out in the rain at night sometime, um, you can get involved in one of those uh, volunteer projects to help salamanders and frogs across the road in their, their migration route. There are even towns that, that when they're putting in new roads build um, passageways under the road for, for um, connecting uh, either wetlands to wetlands or wetlands to upland habitats so that those animals can pass safely under the road instead of across the road. Um, the Harris Center for Conservation Education here in New Hampshire, um, if you uh, go to their website or if you go to naturegroupie.org, um, they're actually having an online training tomorrow night. I just, I just noticed the other day uh, on how to, how to help animals across, or amphibians across the road during big night. Uh, and they have volunteer um, projects that you can sign up for if you're, if you're interested. So that's a great way to get involved. Um, and it, it, really, um, it really helps when most of the um, sort of the, the wetland protection that has happened over the years has um, at the state or federal level happens uh, through regulations for wetlands that are over 10 acres and vernal pools usually fall under that. So um, they haven't had a lot of protection for decades, but just in the last couple of decades, um, more and more people are paying attention to the unique nature of these wetlands and uh, the, the, um, the kind of the, the vernal pools that are, that are important or, or significant wildlife habitat um, can be reg regulated once they're known to support these breeding populations of amphibians. So there's sort of a combination of regulatory efforts to protect vernal pools, but a lot of local and volunteer efforts as well to identify and, and where vernal pools are. This is a, a list of um, available resources. You, you can pretty much Google anything about vernal pools and you'll find all sorts of great resources, but these are some of my favorite. And uh, you, you don't have to write these all down right now. This, is, this will be recorded so you can go back um, and find the, these, uh, these sites uh, to help you learn more about vernal pools or, or how you might be able to be involved in the local community on protection of the pools or the animals themselves. Um, there's a great, uh, well, Stamp the New Hampshire Fish and Game has lots of information about the different species that depend on our vernal pools in this state. 
And then uh, the state of Maine also has this great um, uh, website, uh, Pools and People, that has great information about the pools and, and protection and communities working together on planning to protect vernal pools. They have great resources for kids' books. They even have this cute little song about vernal pools, which I'm going to spare you because I'm not, I'm not a good singer. I'm not going to sing it for you, um, but it's a great resource as well. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty much the program. I wanted to, before I take uh, questions, I wanted to have a little bit of a, a frog quiz, um, or at least um, get you thinking about the sounds that you can listen for uh, this spring. Uh, some of these will tell you where vernal pools are. Some will tell you where the larger wetlands and marshes are, and they're so fun to explore at night um, with a flashlight, whether um, they're in your backyard or um, around Chicago Lake. Um, so I'm going to play a song, and I'm going to have you think a little bit about what it might be, and uh, and then I'll tell you uh, tell you what it is. Okay, so here's the here's the first one. <laughs> So that's one of our earliest songs. Sound like quacking ducks. That's the wood frog. It's up on the left-hand corner. Um, so they're going to be out the earliest. And, they're, and though they're quite noisy when you get close to the pool, their voices don't carry very far. So you have to listen very carefully to find them. And um, once you find them croaking like that, you've found a vernal pool, um, especially if you go back later and find evidence of, of eggs and reproduction. So here's another one. Hope you can hear those. I bet everybody knows what those are. Oh, Add your head, yes. <laughs> um, those, are the, those are the spring peepers. They come a little bit later. Um, that's it, you can put your thumb up if you, if you uh, know what they are. Um, and then there's, let's see, there's this one. This one might be a little bit more challenging. They come out a little bit later, um, late spring, early summer, more early summer. Kind of a groaning sound. That's the pickerel frog, one of the frogs with spots. Here's another one that comes um, fairly early. Uh, late, late spring, early summer, quite loud. Oh. Okay, that's the one with the warts you shouldn't touch. Just kidding. You can touch a toad without getting warts, don't worry. Um, but that's the, that's the American toad. They have this really long trilling sound. Here's one that comes uh, uh, a little bit later. Summertime. Very uh, kind of loud trilling sound. You often hear them up in the trees before you hear them down on the ground. Um, those are the gray tree frogs. Um, gray is a little bit of a misnomer because sometimes they're green um, or they change depending on the color that they're sitting on. So the two pictures of the, the tree frog down on the left hand corner are both tree frogs, but um, for whatever reason, they changed color. They were sitting on the chair on my deck. Um, here's a summertime sound you'll hear. You'll hear those all around Lake Chicago. That's the green frog. It sounds a little bit like a banjo. Um, it's a good way to remember it. Uh, let's see. That's your leopard frog, not quite as common, um, later, bit later in the summer. 
Um, they actually, both the leopard frog and pickerel frog, although they breed in marshes and lakes, um, spend quite a bit of time around grassy fields around the edges of wetlands or sometimes around your lawn. I bet you recognize that one too. Um, that's the, the, the big old bullfrog um, that you'll find around bigger lakes, lakes and ponds. So that just gives you a sampling. It's not all our frogs, but some of the most common ones that you should hear um, early this spring and, and into the summer. And I would encourage you to, to recognize those calls because it's a great way to figure out where wetlands are, whether it's a vernal pool or a larger marsh. Um, some of those species aren't as common in the New Hampshire fishing game has a, um, a reptile and amphibian reporting form that you can either fill out online or uh, send in the mail. And they're always asking for uh, reports about where these animals are. Uh, they need all the help that they can get because they're somewhat limited in, in staff like most uh, state fish and game departments are. So citizen involvement is a great way to, to get, um, get species on the map in the state and help biologists figure out um, the best way to protect habitats and the animals that depend on them. So, so that's it for the, the presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing and um, answer any questions you have. Hopefully... I answered some of the earlier questions in the program, but if you have any uh, outstanding ones, um, uh, let's see. Let's see, Jim Diamond noted somebody asked earlier when the ice was going to go out on the lake, and when we were when we were commenting on that, he said uh, last year was April sixth based on his notes. Uh, so let's see, there's a question about how long um, salamanders have gills. Um, it's usually uh, most of the time that they're in the pool uh, and that timing depends a little bit on temperature. So they, they may take um, over a month or a month and a half to develop fully to an adult but that time can be uh, shrunk down if the water temperatures are quite warm. Both the frogs and salamanders will develop more quickly um, if the water temperature is, is warmer. Um, so I think the, the gills probably go partway through that, that time frame. Uh, let's see, where can I get that book? I'm not sure which book it is, but if it's the New Hampshire, um, Little pool book. Uh, it's a, just a PDF you can download from the Fish and Game site. Um, I don't think they send out paper copies, but I think you can download it as a as a PDF. That's where that's where I got it anyway. Um, what do turtles eat when they visit vernal pools? They eat anything: um, frogs, salamanders, uh, eggs tadpoles, all the different invertebrates that are living there. So it really is sort of a smorgasbord of, of a whole lot of concentrated food in one spot. So rather than exploring a larger marsh or wetland looking for more um, spread out food sources, they can go to this one little pocket and feed voraciously before they, they go to another vernal, vernal pool or other wetland. Um, have I uh, have you seen evidence of climate change affecting viability in the pools? Um, I haven't personally. Biologists are looking at that. Obviously, um, the ways climate change uh, might affect vernal pools, you could probably imagine um, changes in the amount of of rain we get every year, um, the temperature variation that may cause a pool to dry up more quickly. Um, if it's too cool, the eggs may take longer to develop or the larva may, may take too long to develop before the pool dries up. So there's all sorts of uh, kind of different ways, temperature-wise and, and moisture-wise. And, and then, of course, you have the um, sort of the, the um, temperature doesn't really line up, you know, or the, or the current weather at the time doesn't line up with the hardwiring of amphibians coming out of their um, the hibernaculate in the forest surrounding the vernal pools. So they're 
there are those connections that are of concern. And then, um, you know, one other obvious one is if, if we have a, a winter that starts with a really cold temperature and freezes the ground before we get good snow cover, those amphibians that, especially the wood frog, that um, just hibernate under the leaf litter in the woods don't have any good snow cover for insulation through the winter. Um, so there are lots of different ways that, that uh, it can affect amphibians, and it's something that um, scientists are, are looking at. Um, are vernal pools protected from development? So the answer to that is yes and kind of yes and no. Um, the regulations in New Hampshire uh, come through the uh, New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Uh, usually it comes into play when you're going to have a development um, and have to apply for a dredge and fill permit. Um, then the, the mapping or identification of vernal pools comes into play. Uh, but it's not just identifying the pool itself. It has to identify the fact that it's an important breeding habitat for those specific indicator species of amphibians or insects. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to, uh, it, historically it was hard to protect vernal pools because they essentially disappear for part of the year. If they dry up, they just look like a hollow in the ground. They don't necessarily look like a important habitat. Um, so, each of the New England states have some form of regulation that applies to vernal pools, but it's supported by identifying and mapping those vernal pools and making sure that they're, they're critical wildlife habitat. Uh, Mary Cronin's been posting a few in the uh, comments about uh, surveys, links to different surveys, which is awesome. Thank you, Mary, for, for doing that. Um, what time of the day do the wood frogs make noise? Well, um, most of these animals tend to be nocturnal. Um, wood frogs during a, a spring when there's a warm afternoon, I've heard them in the afternoon too, but they also go through the night. Um, so you can start listening to them in the afternoon when things, things warm up. Uh, Juno, good question. Sequestering carbon. <laughs> um, that's, uh, that's something scientists are working on right now. Um, her, her question was, does the quote about leaves hopping and flying out to the pool suggest that these creatures have a role in sequestering carbon? Um, so the, the thought is uh, right now that when they, when those amphibians leave the pool, they go into the forest and they become an important part of the food chain um, in the forest. And in the case of uh, salamanders, for example, they're eating a lot of invertebrates that are responsible for chewing up all those dead leaves that are in the forest floor. Those, uh, those leaves, um, when they're chewed up, don't uh, sequester carbon quite as well. And so the salamanders have a role in controlling the kind of the population of the different kind of uh, the leaf, the leaf um, chewers and and may have a role in the carbon kind of carbon cycle in the forest. That's fairly new uh, uh, studies that scientists are working on, as far as I know. So um, I don't know the full answer to that, but that's where that's where they're leaning. They're looking at those different roles that all these amphibians, by the thousands that go back to the forest, the role that they play in the the carbon cycle in the forest surrounding the vernal pools. Uh, I think I got through all of them. All the questions, unless anybody has any other ones. <laughs> uh, Juno asked another question about uh, fairy shrimp uh, and their short life cycle. They're, are they mostly really yummy food for others? Um, well, yes, they are for good food for others. Um, but there are quite a few invertebrates that have that really short life cycle. Um, mayflies are another good example. You know, their, their role is pretty much to be food for others and to reproduce and lay their eggs and die in a very short period of time. Um, their, their primary function is, is just to continue that population um, of, of animal. Uh, how big are fairy shrimp and what preys on fairy shrimp? So, Fairy shrimp are anywhere from a half inch to an inch. Um, 
so so pretty small but large in in the context of some of the other invertebrates that are in the pool and uh, virtually any any of the larger amphibians uh, and reptiles that visit the vernal pools will feed on them um, I would imagine there's some uh, birds that come to the edge of the shore and might feed on them I don't know if that for a fact but um, I would think that they they would do that um, so I think they're like most invertebrates are are uh, kind of the French fries of the natural world in, in some respects. Uh, I've heard that, that French fry term used for small mammals. So the French fries for all the other predators that, that, um, that, that eat them, but it probably applies to a lot of the invertebrates as well. So um, any other questions? You can either unmute yourself or, or ask. Um, if not, um, I, I would challenge you to, to, if you don't have a raincoat, to get a raincoat, go out on the next rainy, warm um, evening when the, most of the snow is gone for the, from the forest and, and find a kind of a wetland or a pool near you and, and look around the edges. Um, it's a pretty cool sight to see amphibians just crawling over the forest floor to the pool and, and spotted salamanders especially shining a light into the pool and watching them do their courtship dance and um, it's, it's, it's another world. So I encourage you to, to get out there. And uh, you know, if, you're, if you can walk to the place you wanna go, go look on that rainy night, that would be best. Um, if I had my way, I'd tell everybody to stay off the roads on a rainy night um, so you wouldn't hit amphibians. But if not, um, drive really, really slow. Um, so you're not uh, unintentionally squishing them as you drive to your favorite vernal pool. Um, thanks everyone for uh, coming tonight and uh, Enjoy your evening.